utilizing Zoom simulations. Right. Good evening. Uh, I guess, uh, like me, most of you have your head full of things. So I was uh, thinking having a very short talk. So I'm going to talk about only two things. And then in the end, Mathieu will t take over. And so he'll be the person between you and wine. OK, not me. So I'm going to talk about supernova-driven winds and enrichment. So we heard lots of things about uh, subgrid schemes, how you use your subgrid scheme to make millions of galaxies. Um, and so in the context of petascale computing or exascale computing, I see these, um, uh, these kind of calculations as a, a way forward to bring together the different communities, the star formation community, the, the stellar medium physics community, and the galaxy formation community. And I would like to see exascale computing as bringing these, com these calculations together. So the big advantage of cosmological simulations is that we know the initial conditions. You can observe the initial conditions. That's a very big advantage. As soon as you throw that out, if you do star formation or interstellar medium, you always need to worry where do your initial conditions come from. So that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. So we think that supernova drive winds out of galaxies. I'm going to try to make some progress on that and see whether that's really possible. So that's my one uh, thing that I want to show. The second thing I want to show is a, a new scheme for parallelization of simulations. I'm going to apply that to Gadget, but I suspect or I hope that it could be possible to use this for other codes as well. So here's my introduction for supernova-driven winds. So there, as you see, a supernovae. Um, if you do this in a subgrid physics scheme, remember we cannot resolve stars there, we cannot resolve supernovae. So then you say if I make some amount of stars, delta m star, I assume some stellar initial mass function, I assume I know how much energy comes out of a single supernovae, then my amount of stars translates in amount of supernova energy, which is of the order of delta m star over 100 solar masses, 10 to the 51 ergs. 10 to the 51 ergs is the amount of supernova energy per supernova. You get about one supernova per 100 solar masses of stars. So that's the amount of energy you have to play with. So in your subgrid scheme, you have to do something with that energy, and I hope it drives the wind. Okay? So you, you can inject this energy as hot gas, as a wind, as some combination of those. The trouble is that as you inject this energy into the gas, the gas will start to cool radiatively, and the radiative cooling rate depends very sensitively on temperature. And so the outcome of that subgrid physics scheme will depend very much on what exactly you do in injecting this energy. Okay. So the naive implementation of this scheme then depends directly on the numerical scheme. And so you may converge as you increase your resolution, but there's no way that you can be convinced that that conversion is a true, true physical answer, okay? So because the cooling rate depends strongly on density. So for example, you can decide to give all your energy to one particle, then you get a reheating temperature of 2 times 10 to 7 Kelvin. Or you say, ah, but I do SPH, I need to smooth my energy over the particles. I give it to 48 particles, okay? You get the reheating temperature of a half times 10 to the 6 Kelvin. These values are set by the Chabray initial mass function, okay, by physics. But the cooling rates differ by a factor of 10, okay? And arguably, from a numerical point of view, the SPH thing would be the better thing to do. But clearly, it will depend very strongly on what you do. So here is my one slide of how a supernova works. So the star ejects, it, uh, uh, the star ejects, uh, explodes, okay? It cools very rapidly, adiabatically. It runs into whatever is around that. That generates the hot interior. That hot interior pushes the shells forward until the stuff cools, and then you have the momentum-driven phase, okay? That's my view. That's my very simple picture. So I said, so you put your 10 to the 51 ergs into 100 solar masses of stars. Remember, because you have one supernova per 100 solar mass of stars, you get 10 to the 7 Kelvin. But actually, you, you may say, well, what I should do is put my 10 to the 51 ergs into 10 solar masses of stars, because that is the mass of the supernova ejecta for, say, 25 solar mass uh, supernova. OK. So note the huge difference in temperature of the, the ejecta. OK. Now, if you could resolve these supernova explosions, you wouldn't need a subgrid physics. You wouldn't. You would Every star would be one supernova, okay? So why can't we try to do simulations where every supernova is indeed a single explosion, okay? This is the injection temperature, and then you see whether you can drive a wind. And so that is what uh, Peter Kreese did for his thesis. So we cannot do a cosmological simulation at this resolution, though, because you need to resolve the individual supernovae, okay? So we try to simulate 
a, a, a slice, um, a column of gas perpendicular to a galactic disk, okay, and we follow each individual explosion. And so then you can see how um, um, supernova bubbles overlap and they build up a uh, highly porous hot, hot phase medium that bubbles out of the galaxy. Okay, so these are the simulations that uh, Richard showed as well. So then you can uh, vary the properties of the galaxy, vary the properties of the disk, and see what fraction of the injected supernova energy now actually gets radiated away, and so it's not useful for driving a wind. And so that is what you, you get then. The higher surface density disks have higher density, the cooling rate is higher, and so they're less efficient at driving a wind. Okay? So that's the paper that was published. So recently we've been trying to improve on that. So in blue is what we had so far. What we added in the new paper, which hopefully we submit at some stage, is in addition to the supernova energy, we track the supernova ejector themselves, mass, energy, momentum. That allows you to track the metallicity of the gas and the stellar winds of the precursors. We try that. Then you get plots like this. So this is a cut through the galaxy. You see density, temperature, and metallicity. Not surprisingly, where you inject the energy, that's also where the metallicity is higher because it's the same process that injects the metals that injects the, um, the energy. And as a consequence, you get a relation in the gas between its temperature and metallicity, with the higher metallicity gas being a higher temperature. And as a consequence of that, the metallicity of the outflow depends on the properties of the galaxy. Because if you have a, low, uh, if you have a small galaxy, okay, then you have a very high mass loading, and uh, lots of low metallicity gas goes out of the galaxy. You go to a high density galaxy, okay, and only the very hot stuff gets out, and that by definition is then very metal rich. Okay? So that was my first bit on, um, on the effects of uh, supernova on driving the wind. So the next thing I want to talk about. Just say, you, you talk only about winds or no winds. Is there a galactic problem that produces. So the, in, in, at this level, we cannot really distinguish because we simulate a single column. There is no galaxy. It's almost like the matrix. There's no galaxy. Is there gas that goes up and down? But not in the simulation because we don't have a halo. Okay. So if you, if you now give me a, a computer with a thousand times bigger, then maybe I can try to have the galaxy. But at the moment, I need to guess what happens to the gas as it flies out of the simulation volume. Okay. But that time, I don't know where it's going to come back or not. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, gravity, yes. Yeah. True, but the gas may stop because it runs into the gas that's already there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So absolutely, so there is no structure in the ISM because there is no galaxy. I don't know how to put that. I can put it in by hand. So that was the big thing that I started by saying. You, you can guess at other initial conditions. This is in, this is in 3D, yeah? Yeah. yeah. I, I just show you the slides because... Uh, <laughs> so, <not easy>. yeah. <laughs> so, two minutes about um, zoom simulation. So, the, a big advantage of zoom simulation, obviously, is that you can combine the cosmology with a very high resolution. Okay? So, you have the initial conditions, so you can put all your computing power in uh, simulating a single galaxy. The trouble is that these zoom simulations run very inefficiently. Okay? So, this is one zoom simulation. Here are some more zoom simulations. Here are some more zoom simulations. If you look at the efficiency of these calculations, it's, it's very poor. And I'll show you that at the Aquarius simulation. Remember, Aquarius simulation is dark matter only built up of a single galaxy. Okay? So let me show you some scaling relations here. So, so here's my plot. Okay? This is... Um, sorry, let me something. Ah, just the, the, the computer that broke down. Yeah. So... <laughs> So this is expansion factor. So the horizontal axis is simulation time. So it's very close to the end of the calculation. And what I plot is the speed of, a, of, a, of the code on a given number of cores in units of the speed on 24 cores in such a way that if it's one, okay, it's perfect scaling. Okay? And so this, the scaling is relative to running this Aquarius calculation on 24 cores. That's in red. That's by definition one. Then. 
Okay. So black is if you run it on 12 cores, so it's the same speed. So it sp scales exactly strong scaling from 12 cores to 24 cores. You go to 144 cores, 288 cores, 600 cores, we're now at, I don't know, 20% efficiency, 30% efficiency. So why is that? That is because of load imbalance. What is shown here is the total CPU time spent as a function of time and what the code is doing. So this is tree walk, so useful calculations, okay, force calculations. Tree walk plus imbalance, cores waiting for each other, okay. You increase the number of cores from 24 to 288, okay. The tree walk, not surprisingly, takes exactly the same amount of time, okay. Tree imbalance increases. You go to 600 cores, it keeps on increasing, okay. So that's for gadget two, out of the box, gadget three, as a better domain decomposition, but unfortunately, load imbalance is still very large, okay? So this is now 10 to the 8 particles on 240 cores. This is tree walk, useful calculation. This is tree imbalance. The calculation is dominated by imbalance, okay? This is, I don't want to take a swipe, swipe a gadget here. PKD graph has very similar problems. I'm very grateful uh, for Joachim to give me this plot. This is same timings for, or similar timings for PKD graph. A very large fraction of the calculation time, different cores are waiting for each other. Okay. So what is my suggestion? Uh, I've been experimenting a little bit with node parallelization. The easiest way to explain this, suppose it's a small calculation which is so small you can run it on one physical node. Okay. So here's my node with nine processors. I put all my cal calculations on eight core on the nine cores of a single node. Okay. Then what I do, I have a big machine, okay? So I just copy the simulations on many, 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 many nodes, okay? So the, remember, so every node now has all the particles, okay? So task zero, T zero on node zero, cannot calculate the, the, the accelerations of a fraction of particles, and uh, task uh, zero on node one can then calculate a fraction of the other particles, and they can each calculate accelerations on a fraction of the particles, and at the end, uh, these nodes then need to gather all these accelerations and then, you know, the accelerations on all the particles, okay? If you do that, how well this works? So there, here is um, uh, 144 nodes again, okay? So this is tree walk, that is tree imbalance. You increase the number of nodes, okay? And of course, the, the, the calculation time doesn't change, but very nicely, the load imbalance time doesn't increase, okay? So you can run it on 100 nodes, okay? And on 100 nodes, the imbalance is exactly the same as on one node, okay? So to, sh to show you that I'm not making this up, the tree walk fraction on 1,200 cores now is 40%, which is very close to what it is on 12 cores, okay? So this is gadget out of the box. On 600 cores, the tree walk is only between 15 and 20%, okay? That is not so the nice thing about that, so ask me more if you're interested, the nice thing about that is this is, I don't think this is uh, limited to a gadget, I think any MPI code you could easily parallelize like this. Right. So, so, the, so the big advantage of using MPI is that it doesn't need to be limited to a physical node, you can use the MPI if your code doesn't fit on a single node, you run it on two nodes, and then um, multiply the two nodes. Right. Magic. Can you stop for letting me speak during your uh, new slot and for making me the most hated person in the room? So I'm a PhD student working with Tom, obviously, and uh, Richard Bauer and uh, Carlos Frank, mostly on the Eagle simulation at the moment. And when time allows, trying to do some hydro stuff, um, hold on. Does it work? Which one is it? No. No. There. Okay. So, um, yeah. Over the last few years, uh, we have heard that from that standard SPH is not good enough, or might not be good enough, and that some Voronoi mesh techniques might solve uh, everything. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't want to enter this uh, debate. But what's certainly true is that's definitely way more expensive to run the Voronoi tessellation, the Voronoi mesh code. Um, and from, so standard SPH probably, if you want the worst, give you the worst answer, but the cheapest, and I'll put some other um, 
techniques used in fluid dynamics here, which are not been seen very much in uh, astronomy. And so it's definitely more expensive. And um, by trying to quantify this and see whether we can uh, learn something from, um, by trying to combine something and find a sweet spot in the middle where we get better accuracy than SPH at a lower cost than the Voronoi technique. And so how can we quantify precisely how um, expensive a simulation is? Well, you can look at, for instance, in this case, the, the interaction between two cells or two particles. So if you take you know, SPH, we need to co try to compute the interaction between two particles. It only depends on the quantities stored on, on those two particles. So the interaction between particle I and J depends only on the properties of I and properties of J. That's it. If you take a Voronoi mesh, or a, the, you can write the equation like this. So for a quantity U that's going to be exchanged, you have, sorry? No. That's when you compute the density, but we are in the second loop. You have your algorithm, which does only one sweep. That's different. But if you take, oh, that, we're going for Voronoi here. So for, for Voronoi, the, if you exchange a quantity U, say density, um, then you have the Riemann solver F, of R, uh, F here, which gives you the, the flux, and it depends on this beta ij, which is a function from all the local neighbors of the mesh. And so that's a major difference with SPH, where the, the, in, instead of requiring only two um, um, data sets in memory for the interaction here, you need um, a whole, and an also an unknown amount of um, neighbors. And so you can put a, a line in between here saying that everything on its left here uh, only needs pairwise interaction, whereas on the right, it's an unknown amount. In principle, it could be even infinite. You could even need all the, the neighbors in the box. That's not correct. So if you do only the local tessellation, but Yes, but here on the left, in SPH, you only need the information from two particles, we you need more here. So on the right, no, <laughs> I disagree with this statement. <laughs> when you compute the density, if you do the density loop of SPH, you just need the interaction between I and J. You need what you need to do in SPH is find all the pairs of particles within distance h. And that's a pairwise problem. You need to find pairs of particles within distance h. Now, if you do a Voronoi tessellation or any tessellation, you need for one single cell, you need to take the particle or the, the mesh generating point and all of its neighbors to build one cell. That's all I want to say here. So here on SPH, you can build an algorithm where you need to find pairs of particles. And here you need to find a particle in all of its neighbors. And so we exploit this difference in the code that um, Pedro Gona is going to speak about tomorrow, where we have, using this, uh, this pair finding algorithm is, allows much either parallelism. And so we have a code which is 50 times faster at finding particles and doing interaction than the implementation of Voronoi mesh techniques we all know about. 50 times faster on the same machine, same, same set of particles. Now, I said we're trying to find a sweet spot in the middle, so let's see whether we can um, approximate the mesh in a way that we don't need to find all of the neighbors of a given particle to um, compute the interaction. So we need to find an approximation of the mesh which would um, be good enough but cheap to compute. So for instance, if you, were to, if you look obviously at staring at Voronoi meshes for a while, um, you'll see that obviously the, this, the, the interface between two uh, cells is smaller when particles are far away, at least on average. So if, um, let me go back to this. So that's something you could use, say you could have, you can say the, the, the surface between the cell is proportional as well can decrease as one over the distance between the particles. So you can something like an SPH kernel. And so you can construct 
can try to invent functions that mimic this and try to approximate um, Voronoi tessellations. But that's what we did. And so you can invent, say, this, uh, the term beta ij that, beta ij that I had earlier by just saying that it's going to be the volume of the two cells multiplied by a kernel function, SPH-like, uh, sorry, the gradient of a kernel function. And that gives a first order approximation to the mesh. More precisely, you could actually express the most general way if you add, assign um, a characteristic function of any shape to a set of particles, and then you try to compute this interface, you get this horrible integral here, which depends on both i and j, but also of an unknown amount of neighbors. If you tailor expand this beta ij, you get the term I had earlier. So that's a first order approximation to um, the, this horrible I exact integral. I was mentioned that the Voronoi tessellation is an exact solution to this if you send the characteristic lengths of the, um, so if you send h, the smoothing lengths of the SPH thing to zero, for instance, or you can take any other shape, it works as well. So now the issue is, if you, you can now use high order terms in the expansion, and you see the next to leading order is this second order gradient of uh, one over the sum of the neighbor thing. And so you can say, so my mesh, is not, my approximate mesh is not good enough, but I can try to move my particles in such a way that this term gets minimized and that my mesh, my approximate mesh is as correct as possible. So you have this freedom because you can move the points as you want in this case. It's not like SPH where the motion of the particles is bound is, is always the same as the motion of the fluid. Here you have, say, V, the motion of, of the fluid that you want to represent, and then W would be the, the, the velocity of the, the mesh generating points. And these are independent. You don't want them to, be, to drift too much apart because otherwise you get issues with the Riemann solver and so on. But um, to first order, you can, you can um, use the, the ALE ability of the scheme to uh, minimize the error. Yes. Sorry? No, because... So if you start with a mesh, say, the, the best... Well, you have the zero for this if you say if you start in a honeycomb, say, in two dimensions. Then you, you solve your fluid equation, you get the velocity V, and then you can move the particle with this with this velocity, and then this is going to distort your ideal mesh. But then you can add a correction to move the particle, but the fluid is still moving all above the on your mesh. Well, yes, sure, but then your, your, your fluid is completely drifting apart, and you end up... Sure. But what happens then is that the fluid is moving through your mesh. And so then there is no point in having, the, then you don't have a Lagrangian code anymore. Your code is not Lagrangian anymore. So you have a Lagrangian code, which we try to avoid. But it depends what you come up with. What depends what F you choose. But I have a better, so instead of using F, you could actually use SPH because you know from SPH particles, that they reorganize themselves on the honeycomb structure anyway in two dimension or in any uh, FCC cells in 3D. And so what you can do is move the particles with SPH. The worst implementation of SPH you want doesn't matter as long as they reorganize themselves. And then once you have the particles, which are, which are going to be as organized as possible, you can then on top of that use the, the approximate uh, Voronoi mesh and use this to do the, hydro, the hydrodynamics. So you have SPH which gives you bad derivatives, horrible motion of particles, but still good enough so that the, the particles more or less track the matter. But then on top of that, you build good hydrodynamics, but at a cheap cost because your interactions are only pairwise between particles. And so you can parallelize this very efficiently and be at least an order of magnitude faster than current implementation of Voronoi meshes. Uh, showing that it works, just one example. So the Kreshul-Chan vortex, the vo rotating vortex. So 
Um, it's a well-known case where gadget fails, so early implementation of SPH fail on all, on all on this, so in blue is the analytical solution, in green is gadget result, in red is our, uh, the scheme we propose here, which is exactly the same, you get the same answer than uh, for annoying techniques in here. Um, but um, I'm not a big fan of this kind of test because they don't show the ability, the, the, all the Lagrangian ability of the code and all the um, multi-scale and uh, things. So there are not many test cases available with known solutions <coughs> where you can actually test the code to what you want because you can do this with, I mean, for instance, uh, your code does as good as that with SPH. So, sorry? Yeah, you know, all codes can do that apart from gadget, I would say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but then finding challenging um, test cases is not easy because there are many cases where you can ever do everything with SPH and so you have to find something that SPH can't do that you can do with other codes and start trying to struggle. So that's my um, conclusion. Thank you very much. So I was going to say a couple of inflammatory things before, <laughs> before we break for dinner.